We're going to spend this video discussing a little bit about the differential building for something like delirium. And it's important to appreciate that up until now, the page has been dedicated to the workup, and that's not really going to change. However, we're going to kind of expand upon kind of more defining specific uh, diseases and etiologies of delirium. But that's not to say that during our initial workup, the topics that were covered um, previously, we weren't already doing this in our mind. We weren't already building our differential. Instead, we're kind of going to use this as an opportunity to evaluate how people typically teach students broad spanning differentials initially. For example, if this is your first time thinking about delirium, oftentimes um, educators will organize all the causes of delirium by organ blocks. For example, you know, everything in the nervous system that can cause delirium versus everything in the cardiovascular system or the respiratory system or by disease classes. And this kind of includes thinking about things in the framework of what are all the malignancies that can cause delirium? What are all the metabolic conditions? Things like that. Um, now, these frameworks of thought do have utility and are useful. However, for our purposes, I actually would like to avoid using these types of classifications. And I will explain why. Um, when we think about organ blocks, they can be very useful as a, as a learner. However, because most everything can cause delirium, doing it in this way, for example, if you think about disease classes, all of the infectious causes of delirium, well, it's pretty much any infection, uh, especially if it progresses enough, can cause acute mental status changes, which can be classified as delirium. So the utility of doing it in this way is a little questionable under these circumstances. And, and thinking about organ blocks, it's definitely true there are a lot of nervous system uh, disorders or conditions that can cause delirium. However, because when we're actually working up the patient in a clinical scenario, we're not going to be ruling out every neurological condition in order before we move on to the other organ system it seems as though maybe we have um, an opportunity to do things in a little bit of a different way that um, might have more clinical utility for us. And the way I would like to approach this is that we have our patient with a delirium, and now we're kind of introducing the broad differential. I would like for us to talk about it in terms of diagnostic modality. Now, this is a very broad term. It doesn't just mean something like a CT scan. It can even be a clinical diagnosis. But what I would like us to do is organize things by the nature of how they're actually diagnosed in, in a medical context. And this is a very odd way of doing it. This is very unusual. I haven't ever seen differentials organized in this way. However, I think that if you take a look at what I have organized below, you will see the value in doing it in this way. And it's not that you'll ignore organ blocks or disease classes. Ultimately, being able to navigate the thought processes in every different way is very useful. But this may just be a better starting point as a learner who's trying to figure out delirium um, and also kind of practically speaking how it's worked up. So what I have below is organized in a few different ways. First and foremost, right after this video, there is a section that has to do with um, building your differential without using clinical studies. Now, this is not to say that you're not going to order clinical studies in the patient um, who ends up having these diagnoses, or that the clinical studies don't have uh, information to tell you or cannot confirm what is going on. 
However, there are certain causes of delirium that really don't have, let's say, a practical lab test, um, either because it doesn't exist or it's not available or its timing is so poor that the patient will be in danger if you wait for its result, where you'll have to kind of make a clinical diagnosis and perhaps act in order to address the situation at hand. A perfect example, but it's not the only one, is opiate overdose. So we have a patient who we think has opiate overdose, and this is where all the things we discussed above really come into play. Um, you think about the, obviously you diagnose them with delirium, they're unresponsive, let's say, and in your history, you, you, you learn that they were actually just now taking um, acutely uh, heroin, for example. On physical exam, you kind of see the, see the characteristic signs where you see their pinprick pupils um, and maybe there's respiratory depression. The picture is there. It supports the idea of opiate overdose. It's very high suspicion. While there are blood and urine tests for you to actually see if there's any opiates in the serum or the urine, this is a situation where more often than not, you'll have to act by giving an opioid antagonist like um, Narcan. And upon that administration, if you see a complete reversal of symptoms where the patient essentially comes back to life and they no longer are delirious, this within itself is very, very suggestive of um, confirming the diagnosis of opioid overdose because you've given something very specific for um, the opioid mechanism of signaling and you haven't done a lab test yet, but it starts to really shift your differential where the whole story makes sense. Now, it's not to say that you're not going to work up the patient and maybe get labs in certain circumstances. You may still check blood sugar um, because there could be multiple things going on at once. Uh, but this is something that more often than not, the real diagnosis comes from the clinical scenario. So those are things we'll talk about first because they're a little bit more acute um, and things that very likely in real life will have to be addressed first with regards to something like delirium. Now that's one major category. The other category is building the differential with regards to things that really do, in some cases, require or really are informed by clinical studies. So it's, it's building the differential with our clinical studies. And the way this is organized is just one order, uh, but what I've tried to do is organize it by not only uh, how common the, let's say, the, the etiology for the delirium is, but also, practically speaking, what type of actual clinical course is going to happen in a setting like the emergency room. And to kind of explain that um, is just to kind of show you and um, go through the different types of studies. For example, what I've started with is finger stick. Um, finger stick studies, really this is going to be for evaluating glucose. Is the glucose too high or too low? This both can cause delirium. It's not to say that glucose abnormalities are the number one cause of, um, of delirium in patients. However, this is probably one of the first studies that is going to be ordered uh, just because it's very accessible, very low risk, can be done while other things are happening, and can rule out something that can be a common cause of glucose, especially, um, sorry, common cause of delirium, especially in, in uh, patients with certain history factors. And it's something that is a little bit of low-hanging fruit in the sense of there really isn't a reason not to do it um, in most clinical scenarios. So we start with foundational elements of the workup like that and explain our differential within those confines. So that's one, uh, finger stick studies. And then kind of in keeping with this order of things, another big class um, of studies that you're going to do that require the same type of sample are venous blood studies. Now, there are a lot of tests you can do on the venous blood. Everything I've listed is not necessarily something you're going to do as a batch at once. 
But within this, I've kind of organized it in terms of what's probably going to be ordered, like a BMP, a basic metabolic profile. Most everyone's probably going to get that, and a CBC, a complete um, blood count. These are just two examples, both from venous blood. Obviously, you want to order both together, so you only stick the patient once. You only have to access them once. Um, and you can kind of see all the different causes of delirium that can be diagnosed or suggested by these different studies. So, for example, within the BMP, we look at a lot of electrolytes. So this is where we can diagnose electrolyte abnormalities, let's say like hyponatremia, which can, of course, be a cause of delirium. Now, this is an important point for us to discuss that when we are building our differential like this and we're learning it in this fashion, it's not to say that when you find hyponatremia in a patient, you stop the workup process. You, you acknowledge it, you're mindful of it, you work to correct it when you start treating the patient, which um, should begin as soon as you can. However, it doesn't stop you from looking at the other electrolytes, looking at the CBC, ordering other tests, because patients can present with multiple possible causes of delirium. And ultimately, you have to be able to reverse the symptoms and the delirious presentation in order to be able to kind of stop working things up. And essentially, at the end of the day, you have to stabilize the patient, uh, fix their issue before you stop. Um, it's not that you just identify it and then you work to fix it and you don't explore other options. So this is very, very important because we don't want to anchor to just one possible diagnosis because a patient could have hyponatremia but they could also have other things. And maybe it wasn't the hyponatremia that was the cause of their delirium. Very hard to know until you fix it, and it either helps or does not help with the symptoms. Anyway, so that's one element where we kind of have things nested. Um, and I've tried to put them in the best order that I've, I, I could. But again, your history and physical is going to kind of change the order in which you you um, will request venous blood studies and how you batch them together. Um, so that's just another example. And then it's not all blood that we're looking at. Other things like uh, lumbar puncture are lower on the list. Um, not that they're not important, but typically when you're working a patient up, before you get to the point of a lumbar puncture, maybe you'll have to get a CT um, before then to see if it's safe to do the LP. Um, and that's organized in that fashion on the page, but also, you know, perhaps to justify it, you have a fever in your that you've noticed in your vital signs that you can't localize with your physical exam or with an x-ray and or, or with a urine analysis, you haven't been able to localize the fever, and it starts to justify why you get the lumbar puncture. So we start to think about the thresholds for ordering tests in this way as well, and it just kind of gives credence to why we would organize it in this fashion. Now, as you get an LP, obviously, maybe you think it's an infectious process, um, and that's what's leading on your differential. But once you get that CSF, maybe there are other things that you want to evaluate um, that you weren't aware of that could be causing delirium. So again, as we think about the LP organized within that category, we have all the tests that we would order or could order on the CSF um, that would give us perspective on what could be causing delirium. So in the end, um, I'm not going to go through every subcategory here. It's all listed there in as organized of a way as I could do it. We start to appreciate kind of the utility of organizing our differential, not by organ systems, not by disease classes, but really by diagnostic modality simply because this is the way patients will be worked up. And as you get a test, you should have the perspective on what it tells you and what it does not. Now, what I also really appreciate is that this is a very odd way of doing the differential building. And I hope to make more resources where this is not the only way the content is organized. And in addition to being odd, it's very painful. And I, I say this because you, we are front-loading the integration that has to happen. Because typically, we learn, let's say, all of these organ systems 
in isolation and then maybe you know along those lines we learn about disease processes and maybe we learn about anatomy and then perhaps physiology is a separate course depending on where you're getting your training it can be done different ways but then when you get into the clinical scenario you start to integrate all of these things that you learned in isolation together and this can cause a lot of pain in the sense that now you have to think about everything at the same time um, but when you were learning it individually it wasn't so bad because it was kind of a neat little block um, of information or neater rather uh, than this so again it's not to say this this method doesn't have utility however I'm kind of advocating for bringing on the pain a little bit earlier uh, which does come at the cost of comprehension in the beginning a little bit but then once you get to this clinical scenario uh, the idea is that you will be pain free or maybe we should say less pain because from the get-go the organizational framework that you have used is a practical clinical one that directly reflects what's going to be happening in the clinic. So think about it, maybe this isn't the way for you to learn, but I, I hope you give it an honest, uh, honest try and you see if, um, if it works for you. So I hope the, the rest of the page is useful and I appreciate you taking the time to, to look at this video.